Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for Dale. We thank you that we are mentioned in your song. Lord, we pray that Brooks will speak the words that are meaningful to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Lord, we pray that Brooks will hold it together to get through this message. It happened. Rather than a six-week series I preached when my daughter Rachel was born, some of you were in the room for the first few of those before you dropped out, um, we're only going to spend one Sunday, I promise, it's only one Sunday, but it happened. For some of you it's also just happened, for others of you it's going to happen soon. Uh, or it's happened a long time ago, she went to college. We're just back. So um, I, 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 no one tells parents what a conspiracy of silence about how challenging this is. Every parent gets the uh, invest in your kid, love your kid, uh, sacrificially do things for your kid. Everybody gets that. Who gets the, and then say goodbye to your kid? Nobody tells you about that. It's ridiculous. Um, and, and so, some of us are just back from uh, dropping walking hearts with legs out of our bodies uh, to college. So, uh, my daughter chose to kick the dust off her heels of this little mountain town, born and raised right here, 18 years, and she chose to go to Loyola University Chicago. So she was looking for urban, and boy did she find it. In Chicago. Rogers Park, to be specific. Uh, and so um, we did what parents are supposed to do. You take your kid to college. We packed suitcases, thank God for Southwest. And uh, that's that's not a bag, it's just a carry-on item, really. It's just a carry-on item. And we'll shove it under the seat and elevate the person sitting in front of us, and, uh, and so off we go, the plane's a little uh, heaviest on takeoff to Chicago, and, uh, and what a way to be welcomed into this urban experience, to take the orange line into the loop, and then try and find the red line, and take the red line north, and then after the red line, get on the purple line, and um, it, it's such a warm way to enter into the college experience. And what says come rob me more than 18 suitcases, uh, after all, in a subway? Uh, and, and so on to the campus we, we went. Uh, we had a beautiful hotel room. My wife found a nice hotel room. Uh, and it became the uh, stockpiling for the apocalypse. And so we got to uh, the first couple of trips to Bed Bath & Beyond were great. Um, I, I started learning the Target outline. <coughs> Uh, of the Target store after those first couple of trips for what you forgot. Um, and so, it, you know, we called it a dorm room. Did you? Yeah, I, I didn't know the term second residence was really much more appropriate. And, you know, you can stuff a lot of stuff into that dorm room. It, it's quite shocking. So, anyway, move-in day came. Seventh floor. Merck's Hall. And because we're Jesuit, two of the three elevators are not going to work just to give you personal uh, virtue. <laughs> Nothing says community like trying to fit your kid's stuff into an elevator with a father who loves his kid just as much as you do, trying to do that at the exact same time. What a special experience. <laughs> up to the seventh floor, into the dorm room, and the dorm room is overlooking 20 yards away, the red line train, elevated. That's going about every 7.5 seconds. <laughs> it, it, it reminded me of Jake and Elwood Blues' view in the Blues Brothers of, of the elevated train. And I'm told after eight or 10 months, you stop hearing the train. Um, so uh, in comes the suitcases into the dorm room, in comes the bags and the baskets, uh, and the lights, uh, and the microwave, uh, the refrigerator, uh, and, um, and the computer. And, and so we start setting up shop, but we've forgotten some things. So we go back to Target. 
Do you know Target very helpfully has actually a cart escalator? So you can pile the stuff around it on top of your car, push it onto the escalator, and it keeps it precariously balanced all the way down. So you can take cart after cart of stuff. And so in the back part of Target, all the parents gathered. We were buying exactly the same thing. Several times I started pushing a cart that wasn't our own. Because it was just the same stuff. And I looked at the father who mistakenly took our cart. So why don't just keep it? It's all the same stuff, it doesn't matter, you know? And, and so the moms have the list. Moms, do you, do you know how you act? You've got the list. You're checking off which microwave has how many uh, amps and what's the wattage. And the fathers are wandering around like they've been struck in a few state of amnesia. The fathers are not blanking a lot. We've got this look like something big is happening and three years later we're going to figure it out. Several of the fathers, we, we, we had solidarity with each other. And we looked at each other with a great amount of community. And I instantly understood how they were feeling because they knew how I was feeling. Uh, and, and, and on it, on it went. Uh, and, and, and so, and there they were in the midst of Target, the little kids. Do you remember shopping for little kids at school? This, oh, it was so sweet. I'm like, oh, oh, they have markers and stickers. It's a little creepy for an adult man to go, oh, here are your markers, you know. Uh, my wife said, don't do that, so I didn't. But, <laughs> And then the mother is complaining about the long list. I, and I looked at them. I said, honey, you have no idea. No idea. So after that third or fourth trip to Target, you get to memorize the layout really nicely. And back to the dorm room. Uh, unload your stuff. Try and plug it in. And by the way, parents, when you take your kids to school, just remember the electrical requirements of your kid equal the Pentagon. <laughs> because they're plugging in so much stuff. There, the, the, the Loyola must have a nuclear power plant underneath it. Um, and, and, and so, in everything gets plugged in, everything gets shoved in, and, and, and whatever. And, uh, and, and then, oddly enough, the moment came. We stuffed everything into the, uh, the boxes, into the, uh, the, the, uh, the trash room. <laughs> uh, and um, all the stuff was put away. And we were all ready. I was ready to go back to the hotel. But strangely enough, my daughter didn't want to come back to the hotel. She wanted to stay in the dorm room. I said, there's a perfectly good hotel. Why aren't you coming? She said, Dad, I mean, this is my room. You need to leave. I said, but, but no, we have a hotel. And so that moment came. Parents, if you've done it, do you remember that moment? So there I was. I was about to totally lose it. I don't say goodbye word. And I sat down at Rachel's desk. There was the Bible that we'd given. You know, we gave those seniors, 35 seniors, those Bibles. Do you remember that four-hour service we had in the spring? And uh, do you know, I've heard from parents all over that one of the few books they took was that Bible from Tom's Uh, uh We took that, they took that Bible with them to college. Does that make you feel good? It should. And then next to Rachel's Bible, was a little leather book called Jesus Calling. Gloria Walker, who's here today, had given Rachel a daily devotional. It's one of Pastor Mark's favorite. Do you know Jesus Calling? And um, I looked up at it, and I took it off the shelf, and the tab was still in the front of the book, meaning she had no opening yet. So Smart Alec Dad says, I'm going to open it, put it to the date, and leave it suggestively on her desk. So I opened up Jesus Calling to August 23rd, which was the day that we were leaving the dorm. Does anybody know what the selection is for August 23rd in Jesus Calling? I kid you not. I have an eternal debt of gratitude to Gloria. I'm sitting at my daughter's desk and these are the words on August 23rd. Entrust your loved ones to me. Release them into my protective care. 
They are much safer with me than in your clinging hands. I'm like, Lord, really? Does it have to be this subtle? If you let a loved one become an idol in your heart, you will endanger them as well as yourself. Remember the extreme measures I used with Abraham and Isaac? I took Isaac to the very point of death to free Abraham from child worship. Both Abraham and Isaac suffered terribly because of Abraham's undisciplined emotions. I detest idolatry, even when it comes in the form of when you release your loved ones to me, you are free to cling more closely to my hand. As you entrust others into my divine care, I am free to shower blessings upon them. My presence will go with them wherever they go, and I can give them rest. This same presence stays with you as you relax and place your trust in me. Watch to see what I can do with them. August 23rd, Jesus called. There are moments when God really speaks with a very clear voice. Is that not true? My mom called him God moments. This was a God. I was able to walk out of that dorm room with a fair amount of dignity. I, I knew that that message was not for Rachel, that message was for me. The next day we went through orientation. The woman stood up in front of the whole parents, several hundred parents, and said, we understand that they look like college students, but they're only four years removed from eighth grade. That was awful thing to hear. <laughs> Sergeant Cunningham stood up and welcomed us on behalf of public safety. This is a Catholic school. Sergeant Cunningham looked Irish and slightly upset, which is exactly the way I want him. <laughs> and then we had a service, and in the service, the chaplain stood up and said, Parents, before we leave, but you put a hand on your child and you're going to bless them before the priest blesses us. Wow. What a way to leave. Can I tell you, friends, that um, I was in the airport after this experience wondering who I was and why. I looked at the readings for today in anticipation of this sermon. I've preached on the gospel reading for the last 20 years when this Sunday's come up. I never even read Hebrews. The author of the book of Hebrews is writing one sustained logical argument about why Jesus is the Messiah. The Jews have been looking for over 700 years for their Savior, and the author of the book of Hebrews is saying Jesus is Him. And right in the middle of that reading, like I've never seen it before. The phrase that's on the cover of your bulletin. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and always. My dad died in the spring. One week after his funeral, my daughter graduates from high school. One of the best clergy I've ever ministered with retired a month and a half after. Robert and Sally Fawcett, great people, are moving away from the valley. When does it stop? When do these transitions end? I used to think so naively that life was long periods of peace and stability punctuated by short moments of crisis or anxiety or change. How foolish. I now understand that life is nothing but transition from one moment to the next moment to the next moment. Uh, people come in and out, and people we love deeply come in and out of our lives. Our bodies are not 
not the same as I was teaching the children. From one moment to the next, there's only one thing that is the same. Only one person. The author of Hebrews knew it. And he was right to us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Who is the person at the end of the day that we are connected to that will never change? Will change. He will not. His promises will not change. His teachings will not change. His challenges will never change. His wisdom will always be there, always faithful, always honest, always true. Our church is dedicated to knowing Jesus Christ. It's the mission of our parish to know Jesus Christ and to make him known. This is why we're here. I understand when you tell me how difficult it is to live life with change. I understand how hard it is to say hello or goodbye. Trust me, I do. But I wanted to come tell you that there is one person that will always be for us in the moment of our need, who we need him to be. And that is the person of Jesus. Thanks be to God.